want to echo all of those thanks and add a thanks to Jennifer for being such a great, it's been a pleasure working with you and, uh, and I'm very excited to be here and to get to meet you all in person. Um, so I am going to just, uh, I have a lot of slides so sometimes I'll just breeze through them <laughs> uh, really quickly but, uh, but um, yeah, so uh, we'll just get started. So um, I, uh, I've been thinking about uh, the replica over a number of years uh, and, and how it functions um, and, uh, and what does it mean to remake an object. So um, it, it, questions about value come up, like um, the difference between a unique object and a mass-produced object. Um, but for me, um, I'm more interested in thinking about uh, the replica as a tool for talking about perception. Um, so I'm sort of interested in the double take moment that it uh, that it affords, and um, and that dual reading between the um, uh, between the um, uh, the object and the rearticulation of the object. Um, so I'll start off by talking about the project. Uh, spoiler alert again! Like this is what you're about to see. Um, so uh, this project is called Chalk to Cheese, and um, it is a 16-foot-long table of objects that are arranged in a chain of associations. Uh, so um, the beginning of the table, uh, so one object sort of connects uh, through a series of associations. They might be through language, um, through typological groupings, uh, formal qualities like color and shape, um, or through visual puns. Uh, so um, you can sort of navigate your way uh, to the end of the table, which sort of the table sort of begins with a grouping of erasers and a, and a domino, and at the end of the table, you'll it, it sort of finishes off with similar objects, so or with dominoes and an eraser. Um, so um, I, I often my projects have an underlying structure uh, that guides how I choose the objects. Uh, so you can see I use. Um, really um, mundane objects like Pepto-Bismol and a toilet plunger and a jar of cheese whiz. Um, uh, so I'm really drawn to using these kind of objects because uh, we don't normally pay them much attention. Um, so uh, by replicating them, they're, they're often also replicated to various degrees of, of verisimilitude. So um, some things are more reductive than other things um, that are replicated in really high detail. So um, kind of draws you in uh, in different ways. And, and uh, besides interpreting this chain of associations, you're also interpreting, reinterpreting these objects that are, you know, um, somewhat familiar. Uh, so uh, you can see it begins sort of with the domino and ends with the dom domino. Um, and the, the connections between objects um, are, like for instance, I think of these objects as connected. Um, I'm not gonna, you know, like you can draw your own <laughs> connections there. And um, same with this. So just some, some examples of, uh, of, of how I draw connections. Um, so I'll, uh, also when I was, um, composing the work, it's sort of like solving a puzzle, like a visual puzzle. So um, there were certain objects that I knew I was I wanted to make, like the stack of cups and the pylon, um, the milk carton. So, um, so I would kind of start with objects and then try to figure out how to make this 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 chain work. So so sometimes an object that I Kind of had to present itself or, or be a, become a piece of the puzzle that I didn't necessarily um, intend on making, but it, it kind of the, the project necessitated it, if that makes sense. Um, so that uh, the the project itself and the structure that I determined for myself ends up guiding um, the choices that I make. Um, So uh, I'll move into a project that I did at Oakville Galleries, um, which if any of you have been there, it's an old estate home that was donated to the city of Oakville. Uh, it's uh, from the 1920s and it's been converted into a gallery. 
And uh, so for my project, I converted it back into a home, but one that was under renovation. So as soon as you walk in, you see this, uh, this uh, room under construction um, and some construction materials. Um, uh, but uh, everything is um, replicated, uh, aside from the plywood and the two by fours. Um, so the insulation foam is painted MDF with screen printed um, uh, Pink Panther uh, pattern. Um, and, oops, sorry. The, uh, the coffee cup is uh, acrylic on wood, and um, the plumbing is also, it's uh, acrylic on dowel. You'll see there's a, also like a measuring tape and a Coke can. Uh, so it kind of implies that, 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 that uh, construction is in process, that it's sort of in the, in the middle of uh, transi a transitional state. Um, so this room actually looked like this before, uh, and uh, I, I built into it and uh, made it smaller. Um, the, the, room, the room is called Addition, but I actually <laughs> contracted the space. Um, and so here's just some details of that, um, what's going on in that room. And then um, there are galleries to the left and right of this space. Uh, so that, that really sets the tone for how to navigate the rest of the rooms. Um, in the main room, which kind of had this grand fireplace, and it was presumably like the, the, the living room um, of, the, of the home, um, I, I made a piece specifically for the mantle, which is kind of a combination of um, practical and decorative items. Um, and then uh, this stylized uh, firewood made of different shaped dowels. And, uh, kind of a dysfunctional fireplace tool. <laughs> um, uh, so we have like the decorative candlesticks, but then there's also paper towel uh, roll and holder and a coffee cup that also looks like it's maybe just left there by the construction team, but also it's so perfectly aligned with the rest of the items that there's kind of this uncanny like perfection to, the, to, to its um, casual placement. And they sort of become stand-ins for themselves and like kind of uh, with the sort of black and white treatment, almost like ghostly versions of themselves. Um, and then at the end of the room, there's this big bay window that normally looks out onto the lake. Um, but I took uh, the opportunity to build, I actually did build a, a room off of the, uh, off of the gallery, uh, which could only be viewed through this window. Um, and um, I thought it would be funny to create a series of uh, really highly detailed replicas um, and make them only viewable through the window. And whereas everything else in the space was maybe more reductive, most of the detail could only be seen from afar. Uh, like the most detailed items could only be seen from afar. So um, these are kind of like items that uh, they're sitting on packing boxes that um, you know, or have yet to been packed, and they might speak a little bit to um, the the owners of the house, uh, and again speaks to the state of transition. And this is what it looked like uh, from the outside. Uh, and again, the blue foam is uh, is um, replica rep replicated. Uh, there's also a Coke can. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, <laughs> getting used to this clicker. Um, so the gallery itself was um, conveniently, in a way, mm -hmm. also under renovation. Um, there was uh, this massive scaffolding that surrounded, oops, I think there's a better picture. Oh, there, yeah. Hmm. Um, it was uh, completely cloaked in this, um, in this netting and scaffolding. And um, a lot of visitors thought that I had also, well, it worked in two ways. Either they thought that this was also my doing, um, or when they walked into the gallery, they assumed that it was under renovation and walk, would walk right back out So, um, and not spend time with the show. So uh, it was kind of this great little um, coincidence uh, that I embraced. Um, so within that same room, there are some like fake sconces and packing boxes. and and that vent, which I actually made 
um, to reflect this vent that I had covered up in the, in the room. Uh, so I pulled the patterning from there. Um, and then uh, the other room sort of had uh, a selection of construction materials. The tape on the wall is um, acrylic paint, uh, the painter's tape. Um, the tops of the, of this lumber were painted uh, so that they produced the glow on the wall, if you can see. Uh, that doesn't show that well on this slide, but, um, but because everything else was replicated, um, it had people looking very closely at these um, pieces of lumber, assuming that they too were replicas, but the, alt but the intervention was really um, this top. Oh, sorry, the clicker is... Uh, and then um, this is acrylic on MDF. Uh, this is a view of the what it looked like when it was under construction from the bay window with a left coffee cup. <laughs> um, and uh, and then the last room uh, sort of had this. Uh, it had the stone walls and terracotta floor and felt kind of like a almost like garage slash like pantry type type of space. This kind of like in between, um, in between space. So uh, I made this pantry shelf of objects that are also kind of part kitchen, part garage. Um, uh, and the the composition, um, and similar to the project upstairs. Um, the composition sort of began with uh, with several objects that I knew I wanted to replicate, but um, there there's there is a lot of consideration around comp formal composition and and it, because it's sort of a tool to get people to look or it adds to the uncanniness that it's so kind of easy to look at and so perfectly formally considered. So um, so. Uh, there was, it was also in a way a, a bit of a, a puzzle to sort of figure out how to, how to balance the objects the, the, as shapes and forms um, to create a composition. Um, and then this is the last piece, which is just found dowels uh, uh, mounted to the wall, um, which mimic the firewood in the first room. Um, so my interest in the replica began with um, a project uh, that I was asked to do for a friend's um, gallery. She was uh, she had turned her handbag into a gallery called Satchel Gallery, and um, so I wanted to make a project that um, made sense in that kind of space. Uh, and while I was thinking about it, it was in an art supply store, and I um, I found these canvases at the front counter that when I just like kind of casually picked up in my hand, it felt a lot like a cigarette pack. Uh, so I decided to buy up different shapes and sizes of canvases and paint them to look like objects that match their dimensions. Um, so this project is called Handmade Ready Made. Um, and uh, and uh, it continued on for many years and I still uh, add to the project. Um, but I'll, I'll collect, I mean it does, branch into other objects depending on the canvases that I find, but I did I, it mostly um, uh, ends up being book paintings, which I curate in ways, this is the super stack, uh, no, super how-to stack, so they're all books on how to be super in one way or another. Um, and these are some other combinations. Um, I also, uh, I mean, normally my, the, the project originated with me finding canvases and matching objects to the dimensions, but in the case of uh, some projects I have custom canvases made, such as this one, which is an um, artist book by Sol Luet that was stacked six times to form a cube. And um, this is a reproduction of a Mel Bachner catalog uh, that has a reproduction of one of his paintings on the cover which I have returned to canvas, <laughs> but with an added layer of text. So <laughs> it becomes this, this kind of a text painting again, basically. But, um, and uh, 
Kenneth Goldsmith's uh, Day, which is an artist book, uh, where he re copy or he includes every single word <coughs> in one day of the um, New York Times, um, and it's replicated seven seven times. And mm -hmm. uh, this is a National Gallery catalog of Donald Judd's work, which itself sort of, uh, well, it's mounted to the wall to look like a, one of his structures. Um, so often uh, these, this project takes the form of installations uh, where, the, where the work, even though they're paintings, I think of them as sculptures um, and they're shown as such in the round. So they'll often like be on bookshelves or um, in stacks, or but never hung on the wall. Uh, this is a project that I did for uh, also adjacent to a library, um, Cambridge Galleries. Uh, so when I was asked to do a project there, I um, I wanted to uh, take a look at how the library uses. Um, like what kind of furniture the library had uh, for me to sort of uh, play around with and reconfigure um, to use in my in my installation somehow um, so that it both fit into the library but also had that kind of jarring um, uh, relationship to regular visitors. So these glass cubes uh, would lie in the entrance of the gallery and they would uh, kind of in a linear uh, stack uh, and it would hold the new releases. Uh, so I reconfigured it into this sort of like Rubik's Cube structure. And all of the books I chose to replicate have arrows on the cover. Um, so they point you through this circuitous loop uh, within this closed uh, glass space. Uh, and it was also re-shown um, in, uh, in this configuration. Um, so choosing the books is always, or the covers, um, uh, is always, again, a bit like solving a puzzle and finding the mates that, that make sense and sort of draw out some kind of meaning from one another other than the content inside the book. Um, uh, and in this case, it was a, a pretty crazy uh, process to try and find arrows because there's no indication from the title. I basically had to pull like every book off of, off of the shelf and hope to eventually find an arrow. So, um, yeah. And again, these are arranged to kind of point you around in this insular space. Uh, this is an example of the, the lumber in the corner um, was canvases that I found in our art supply store um, on Spadina. Um, and there are these long, narrow canvases that really only made sense to me to be painted like lumber. I don't know how anybody else would use that, um, that canvas. Uh, in response to an invitation uh, to participate participate in a show on the theme of gravity. Um, so uh, it's made out of polymer clay uh, with acrylic paint, uh, just to, to render the details. And um, it was originally shown on the gallery floor. And uh, during the opening, it got stepped on. <laughs> and, uh, and during the run of the show, it nearly got swept up by the janitor. Um, uh, so we had a few, I, I had to remake it a few times, a couple of times during the run of the show or repair it. Um, and eventually the, uh, uh, the, the university <laughs> bought it and uh, we, we tried to figure out a way to keep it safe so we mounted it on the ceiling. And it also, I mean it similarly speaks to that impending fall that I was trying to get at with having it on the floor, this idea of slapstick. And, uh, and I also think of it as kind of a, another way to talk about gravity using fruit, like, in the, like Newton's apple talks about gravity <laughs> using fruit. So um, anyhow, this, um, this banana and its impending fall, impending like, uh, anyway, it, um, it, we thought it was safe and about, uh, we installed it and a, and a couple of days before they were actually gonna announce their new acquisitions, I got an email saying mm -hmm. that um, that a night janitor had spotted it on the ceiling <laughs> and uh, had wheeled over a scissor lift and pried it off. Um, so, <laughs> which I actually found funny, and you know that's definitely built into the work. So uh, I couldn't, I couldn't really be angry. Um, so I remade it before uh, they postponed the launch, and uh, and I had time to remake it. 
and it was mounted safely for about a year. Oh. And then I got another call that campus security spotted it, um, and they were uh, less apologetic about, about removing it. Um, and we got no information as to how they got up there. They didn't have access to scissor lift. Um, so we have no idea how they managed to get the banana down. Um, and so I kind of imagine this slapstick kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> trial and error of them trying, like throwing Billy Bats up. <laughs> um, so anyways, it was quite an eventful piece for me. Uh, but uh, funnily, I also have something mounted to the ceiling of the Dunlop. And we're crossing our fingers that we won't have a, a similar uh, episode. But oh, there it is. I was, I was going to not tell you what it was, but it's a balloon. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I, I my interest in the replica began with the handmade ready-made project, and those were very highly detailed replicas. Um, so. Uh, I was, after working on that for several years, really, um, I was still interested in the replica, but I wanted to see what would happen when I um, didn't include all of that detail. Like, when, if I removed information and uh, kind of let the brain fill in the gaps. Um, so how much information was necessary for, for an object to be understood. Uh, so this was kind of the first show that I did that led into um, the work that I'm making now. Um, so, and it really began with the cigarettes here in the corner, which are elongated and uh, um, the color ratios are skewed, but um, they still read very much as cigarettes. So that um, kind of, uh, as I said, um, the ability for the mind to understand a shape despite um, not all the information being um, exactly as, uh, as it is in real life. Uh, this is um, a basketball that's been painted to look like a beach ball. Um, so sometimes I will alter existing objects. Um, so I use the, um, the lines uh, that are pre-existing on the basketball to guide the, the divisions. Um, and that's something that um, I do in my work a lot is I, I sort of look at an object and, and, and um, think about its inherent qualities and uh, I either um, alter them or, uh, or enhance them um, in order to uh, rethink the object. Uh, these are... Um, wooden dowels um, with hole, like of a specific dimension with holes at a, cut at a specific dimension and painted, um, you know, a uh, very specific painter's tape green. Um, so I use color um, to, uh, color cues to help with the readings of the objects. This is called ascending rolls. Um, and this is essentially just a white dowel with a bit of brown paint, but um, but the scale and the and its proximity to other uh, forms um, kind of uh, means that you read it as the toilet paper roll. <laughs> um, it's called monument. It's made out of femo and carved wood and graphite and foam. Uh, this is tennis ball with cheesy wedge, which. Uh, <laughs> I have always been drawn to the tennis ball <laughs> for some reason, but I didn't ever really know what to do with that information. Um, so I just decided to make one and, and get it out of my system. And then it kept rolling off my desk uh, while I was working on it, so I decided to make um, a cheesy to keep it from rolling. Um, and it's made with, um, and it really also came because I, I was in an art supply store and saw this green flocking that was tennis ball color, so it all kind of came. Great. Uh, so it comes like a interactive opera painting, creative record. Uh, this piece um, was has become pretty important to me in that uh, it, it uh, I've I've made several 
other projects based on this idea of, um, of uh, this mirror that, that divides two halves and uh, the, the, the matches on one side are arranged exactly the same on a mirror image on the other side and as you walk back and forth um, it almost feels like the mirror is glass uh, and, and they kind of replace themselves in the reflection. Um, which uh, you can sort of see here, the, the midpoint, the, uh, ooh, what is this? <laughs> where the, the matches uh, match. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, so this, several years later, that, that piece became kind of this, the, the seed of this larger project called Five O'Clock Shadow. Um, so the space is called Convenience Gallery, and artist Flavio Tresavan, um, he lives upstairs, his studio's in the back, and he maintains this big kind of commercial uh, window space as a, um, as a, as a walk-by street, street level gallery. You, you, it's just a window gallery. Um, so when I was invited to um, conceive of a project, I had a completely different idea in mind. Uh, I even started making it, and, but every time I imagined it in the space, I was distracted by this um, division in the, in the window pane. Um, so I kind of scrapped that project and decided to work with that uh, aspect of the space, and I made this, um, uh, basically, I, I put a, a mirror down the, <laughs> down the center of the gallery, of, of the space, and uh, on one side, it's objects replicated in full color, and on the other side, um, it's objects in grayscale. Uh, so as you walk back and forth uh, across the across the mirror and view and view the objects, they can sort of appear to be draining uh, out of color. Um, it also becomes like very uncanny. It, a lot of people ask me if I had put a scrim on the window or. Um, uh, yeah, so um, it sort of became this, I thought it was appropriate also for the uh, passerby traffic to have this piece that was activated by walking back and forth. Um, so you can see the text had to be reversed on the gray side so that it matched in the reflection. Um, and my interest in um, grayscaling actually uh, uh, traces back to um, this grayscale Rubik's Cube that I did. Um, you know what, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so I might skip over this, but uh, mm -hmm. this is also um, uh, uh, an early piece where I made, uh, found these basketballs that, were, that lacked color, uh, which I was drawn to because they were familiar yet kind of unfamiliar. Um, this is a project I did stacking 100 grace rail Rubik's cubes in a hundred different variations. Uh, so kind of riffing off of the idea of a puzzle and a game, um, obviously riffing off of Silhouette, but uh, being drawn to the Rubik's cube for all of its associations and the idea of permutation, um, and kind of like letting that play into the reading of the work as well. And the grid, obviously. Uh, is packaged as a game as well with um, instructions on making the hundred variations. Uh, and then I, I the, my interest in, in um, removing color also can be traced back to these drawings that I did, which are drawings of um, photocopies. Uh, so it began with finding a book on um, on Mondrian uh, that uh, reproduced a lot of his. Um, paintings, but they were all reproduced in black and white, which is really ridiculous because <laughs> his, the titles of his paintings are like composition with yellow lines. Um, so, uh, so I thought that was really funny and that kind of started uh, this series of photocopy drawings um, where I reproduced these reproductions. Composition with red. Um, and, uh, and I made a series, I mean, I've made quite a few of these drawings, but this is uh, the second series that I did after the Mondrian ones, which is of eclipses, because I sort of thought of the act of putting a book down on a photocopier, sort of like creating this eclipse of light. Um, um, so I, I kind of like elaborated on 
um, the Five O'Clock Shadow Project with this project called Doppelkopf, which was made for um, uh, Sheridan College. Uh, they invited me to do a piece there. And again, similar to Cambridge Libraries, I um, wanted to see what kind of furniture and what kind of uh, um, kind of visual vocabulary uh, was already happening on campus in terms of display systems. Um, so I, I kind of repurposed these, um, these two vitrines and uh, put a, a double-sided mirror down the middle. Um, so you have this similar um, experience of passing back and forth and the color draining out. Interestingly, when the color is removed from these office supplies, they sort of become these platonic forms, like cylinders and cubes and, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe less recognizable uh, in some cases uh, without their colored counterparts. I often include um, uh, actual objects amidst the replicas uh, because it sort of adds to that um, um, level of uncertainty of what you're looking at. So, so I mentioned that sometimes things are reductive and sometimes they're highly detailed, but adding in a, a ready-made object or an actual object um, uh, kind of leaves the viewer ungrounded and not uh, really sure of any one way of looking. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the paper clips are real uh, on the other side. The, here they're black and gold, and on the other side they're black and silver. And uh, that's an altered uh, clipboard. And the, the, the CD spindle and DVD spindles are, are uh, wooden dowels painted inside, but the cases are, are real. Um, so I actually have a video. This is another version of that. Um, you can see how the gray and the color um, kind of merge, depending like as you walk back and forth. And hopefully, this—I don't know how to make this play here. Do you think it'll? You don't know how to make a video play with this, do you? Uh, not with that much. Okay. I might be able to on the. It's okay. I don't want to waste time on that. But um, you can you can see that from this image the kind of effect that I'm referring to. Um, oh, wait, okay. Well, okay. 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 <laughs> um, uh, so that, that was a, a sort of a version of these projects that I included in this uh, survey show. Um, which deconstructs a lot of my projects and reconfigures them into this, um, this new kind of iteration. Um, so it's called Inventory, and it is essentially an inventory of almost like a, about six, six years of, of work. Um, uh, and it's shown on cardboard boxes, and often I'll display my work in a way that looks very casual or not, not like doesn't play to gallery tropes of the white plinth and the, um, uh, so it, I feel like that sort of heightens um, the experience of, uh, or disarms the audience um, uh, into um, seeing these objects as like just everyday objects and maybe eventually cluing in that they're, or, and then eventually cluing in that they're replicas. Um, uh, yeah. so there's, You'll, you'll, you will see some of these objects upstairs as well. Um, and I really, the replica is kind of a means to an end as a way of talking about perception and, uh, and getting people to, to kind of look closer and think about the difference between what they see and what they think they see. Um, uh, so the, the replica is really just a, um, a tool. Uh, that's the way that I, I see it. And often I'll include an element um, that may go completely unnoticed um, in the gallery, like this coffee cup that was left on the on the um, gallery tenant's desk um, in, in inventory, uh, and um, or like the uh, 
there would be match on a window, a burnt match on a windowsill in, in the other gallery installations. Um, uh, so uh, sort of like, um, I guess that one last double take moment on your way out the door if you managed to, if you happen to catch it. Uh, these were some leaning uh, fluorescent tubes kind of on the outer edge of the gallery. Um, and this is a, uh, might be the last thing I talk about. Um, it's a piece that I did recently for um, the gallery show with MKG 127. Um, so uh, it was, the show is called Twofold. And um, the gallery, uh, as you can see, has these two long uh, walls that are equal um, in dimension. So I conceived of this uh, project where um, the entire show would be in double vision. Um, so the objects themselves are rendered in double vision, so they're sort of displaced horizontally onto themselves. Uh, and then um, the entire show was doubled. But the, um, the objects on the right side of the gallery uh, differ slightly from the objects on the left side. So there's this kind of like, um, this assumption that they're mirroring each other, uh, but then as the viewer travels around the gallery and detects the differences, they're sort of bouncing back and forth in that in-between space. Um, they're just some of the... Um, I think I will stop there because uh, we're, um, we're at our time mark. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No. Well, thanks, Marla. Yeah. <laughs>